Welcome to Early Christian Views of Jesus, D. Da K, or the teaching of the Lord through the Twelve Apostles to the Gentiles. That's the full title of the document that's passed down to us, known as, in shorter form, the Didache. The manuscript history of the Didache comes to us, it comes to us in several language versions. Um, in terms of the Greek versions, we have a couple papyri, a couple Ankyrankis papyri, dated right to the middle of the 4th century, so around 350, which is not too long after Eusebius, in 324, wrote about the document known as the Didache, or Teaching of the Lord through the Twelve Apostles to the Gentiles, and basically said that it wasn't accepted as part of the Bible canon, along with several other texts. So, when we look at texts, whether it's the Didache or the biblical documents, the New Testament, we use as our standard for evaluation the same thing that secular authorities use when it comes to looking at documents or people from history, and also what Jesus himself has said to have believed is appropriate to use when it comes to determining the things that are true or you could attribute to God, and that is, is it true? Right? Is what we read in the document true and verifiable from other sources that we can use to corroborate what it's saying, sufficiently so that we can rely on it and say that more than likely, even though we weren't there, we have enough information and records and um, um, evidence from different sources to, sh to strongly suggest this is what happened here. Right? It's pretty much the same thing with all of our ancient sources and figures from the past. So it's the same with the Didache. We're going to look at it and say, what do we have in terms of the text? Right. So other than um, some texts in Latin and Ethiopian and references as early as Eusebius in the first quarter of the 4th century and papyri dated to the middle of the 4th century, the only other Greek text we have of the Didache is from a manuscript dated to the middle 10th century. Excuse me. So it's more than likely an early document, probably certainly earlier than 300, more than likely earlier than 200. And if the, there are several earlier writers for example, Polycarp and Ignatius. We've already talked about Polycarp, and we'll be discussing Ignatius soon. His writings are the most complicated to discuss of the early writers, I would say. So we'll talk about that in that video for his for Ignatius. But there are people like him and the martyrdom of Polycarp and other sources, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, that may or may not be referring to the Didache. Right? It's not clear. And some believe that the Didache is actually something that started out as part of one of the documents or writings from the Dead Sea Scrolls, the community rule, <clears throat> and then was built upon into what it became eventually by around the middle of the second century. Now, it might be a little later than that, but it seems like there's enough evidence if we take the earlier references as likely to the Didache so that the date should be put where it, probably I have it, into the first century, middle of the second century. But it's possibly even a little bit later. <clears throat> this series is focused really exclusively on these early documents, teachings about Jesus. Although we are considering texts to talk about God and the Holy Spirit. 
And so it's leading us closer to the time of um, the Nicene Fathers, where we're going to kind of uh, connect the two, this series and the Bible and the Trinity in Conflict series, where we talk about biblical text and the development of the Trinity and the Nicene Fathers. We're going to kind of try to intersect the two, but eventually we'll be doing Athanasius and reading every page of his writings. And at the end of this show, I'll be giving you a preview of part of Athanasius's writings that we'll be going through. I will also be providing a visual for what I mean when I say that certain individuals like Athanasius because of the things they have done. And Athanasius also had some issues, right? A lot of problems with his doctrine and he was banished several times and <clears throat> directly interfered with Arius's attempt to come back after the Council of Nicaea and at least get communion, something even Constantine didn't oppose. But Athanasius was so hateful towards him that he interfered with that. So when I refer to people like him in, in different ways, like false teacher, liar, <clears throat> supporter of false doctrine, right? It's because of some of the more explicit things he teaches that are in direct conflict with what the Bible teaches and also the way he does it. It's similar to some of the people that believe the same things Athanasius does today. So I'm going to give a visual at the end of this video to show what I think is happening to these people and what will continue to happen as we review their doctrine in light of the Bible and based on what they are said to have believed. Now, when it comes to the D.K., we don't know who wrote it. There's no known author. So... If we put it between 95 and 150, I think we're being pretty generous. Um, we don't know who wrote it. We don't have a lot of very clear early references to it. We do have Eusebius referring to it explicitly by 324. And we have papyri dated to 350 in the Achyrhynchus papyri. So that plus, as I mentioned before, <clears throat> The Greek manuscript from the middle 10th century are pretty much the best sources of information we have for the D.K. and some of the references by some of the later fathers. So let's take a look at it. Let's go ahead and take a look at the D.K., the translation by Kearsop Lake from the Loeb Classical Library series. We'll look at the online version together. So this is from earlychristianwritings.com. I've linked this before. I'll put it down below later. I don't think I have it there now. Um, or you can just write that down, earlychristianwritings.com. And you should be able to find this source. It's got actually several translations. This is the Kearsop Lake edition from the uh, Apostolic Fathers the series. It kind of has these volumes. All right. So let's go ahead and what we're going to do, we're not going to read the entire document. It's not that long. I did read the whole thing and I didn't see anything glaringly off in it. There are some issues in it, not necessarily with God, Jesus, or the Holy Spirit. I didn't see any real problems there, but there are some things that I didn't feel were representative of biblical or New Testament teaching. So I'll share those with you as well. Even though I put this document again to dated to between 95 and 150, it wouldn't surprise me if this was actually produced somewhere between 150 and 250. It's still early. We still need to know what it teaches. I'm going to stand by the date of 95 to 150 at this time. But it would not again surprise me if we we're actually hundred years later. All right. So let's take a look at the opening chapter, right? I'll go ahead and move it so that I uh, 
in here. And, well, actually, we'll do it this way. Yeah. All right. So this, this opening part here is just something I wanted to share that I thought was a positive thing in the document. It basically opens up with two of our three main beliefs, which are also stated explicitly in the New Testament, pretty much just like they are here, right? So you can see that it states there are two ways one of life and one of death. And there is a great difference between the two ways. The way of life is this. First, thou shalt love the God who made thee. Secondly, thy neighbor is thyself. And whatsoever thou wouldest not have done to thyself, do not thou to another. Basically, a negative version of the golden rule, instead of do unto others as you would want them to do to you, don't do to others what you wouldn't want them to do to you, which is also a variant reading of uh, that's added to the apostolic decree in some texts. So, and of course, it's also what Confucius taught. But I don't think there's, there is a difference, but I, you know, I've thought about it a lot. and I think ultimately it ends up in practice the same. A little bit different approach to it, but I think ultimately it, it's going to result in pretty much the same outcomes, negative or positive version of the golden rule. I think the positive version is actually better. It's more proactive. It, it's more in. Uh, it's more responsible, right? It's more you doing something to not or be involved or do or do not something. It just has a more active element to it. The, to me than the negative form. Either way, I wanted to point that out because, again, these are two of our three main beliefs stated explicitly in the Bible. So I think this is a very good mark for the writing. This inclusion of love God who made thee. Secondly, thy neighbor is thyself. Right? We know the third is to believe in Jesus and to follow him as the Messiah sent forth by this God which is what this document also basically supports. All right, so that's an important uh, opening part. D.K. teaches two explicitly two of our three main beliefs and ultimately also includes the third, but a lot of other stuff too that we don't. We only require the three. Are there other important things, other beliefs, right? Other ways we try to help people fit into different areas of thought, whether it's the Holy Spirit or Michael, Jesus but consistent with the text, right? But the three are not in that category, right? The, 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 the first three, one God, the Father, Jesus, as the same fourth uh, Son of God and the Golden Rule, they're not like, well, it's either this or that. That's why things like the Holy Spirit and others don't fit into the same category, right? Because they're not. It's not that they're not important. We're talking about very explicit teachings that are not controversial at all, really, unless you prefer false doctrine, right? So the other ones, though important, just don't line up in the same way as the three that we have and that we hold to, right? We don't require anything else, right? We obviously expect people to do what they should do to be live as a Christian, but unless they're just out of control and not able to, to manage themselves, we understand we make mistakes. We're not accountable to each other beyond people doing something directly against us or not showing control because we're all servants of the master, right? All right, now let's get back to this issue of early Christian views of Jesus. But I wanted to make that clear since we had brought up these first two of our main three beliefs in relation to the D.K. and what it teaches. So good, good stuff right there. Now let's go to chapter four. And let's just take a look here. It says right here in the opening verse, My child, thou shalt remember day and night him who speaks the word of God to thee, and thou shalt honor him as the Lord. 
For where the Lord's nature is spoken of, there he is present. What does this remind you of? Uh, John 5, 23, when they say you got to honor the Son just as you honor the Father, right? Kathos. And of course, we've talked about that and showed exactly what it means. <laughs> and which is not what the Trinitarians believe it means, right? But this is an example, right? This is talking about people who teach the Word of God and how they're to be honored as the Lord, right? So let me bring up the, uh, we do have the Greek here. Right there. And so 4, 1 is right here. Try to make that a little bigger for you. Yeah, that should be kind of good. Right? So, right here is the Greek for honoring him as Lord. Timeses de autan hos kirion. But honor him as the Lord. Right? It's not kathos, as, very similar. They're used in very similar ways. But obviously we know that doesn't mean you, you that they're the same, right? But you can see again, I wanted to point it out here because of the way it, it's similar in some ways to how the Bible also speaks, like I said, John 5.23. And just in the representational aspect of honoring someone as someone else, but not being that someone else, right? So I thought that just something I wanted to highlight there. I'll also put a link to this uh, online version of the Greek text below for you. And here's just one part I thought was a little questionable, if not really questionable. It really depends, right? So, You know, it talks about different things here, reproving people, schisms, not being of two minds, one who stretches out his hands to receive but shuts them when it is comes to giving, right? So not being not being giving, right? You'll you'll stretch out your hands to receive, but not to give. Then right after that it says, Of whatsoever thou hast gained by thy hands, thou shalt give a ransom for thy sins. I read that and I thought, huh, well, that doesn't really make sense. <laughs> it's connected with this, right? Be not one who stretches out his hands to receive, right, like this, but shuts them when it comes to giving, right? So instead of keeping them out, when it comes to giving, you bring them in, you don't give. And then the next verse, of whatsoever thou hast gained, right, so what you have, by thy hands thou shalt give a ransom or give, I guess, right, in this sense here, for thy sins. Uh, you know, maybe there's a way that you could understand this, like um, something like the prayer of a righteous person carry, uh, covers a lot of sin or something like that, but that's still a little different, right? This is someone actually using what you've gained by your hands, right? So whatever you have to give as a ransom for your sins. That, that seems incorrect to me. Again, maybe there's a sense where that could be possible and maybe they don't, it doesn't mean actually redeeming the, the, the loss that occurred with your sins with giving. Um, right. Cause our, our, our forgiveness for sins comes through faith in Jesus, right? We don't have this kind of uh, uh, self-atoning ability through sacrifices, whether it's giving or putting something on the altar, right? Which often was a gift. So this, this gave me pause right here. Um, did not strike me as genuinely Christian in the New Testament sense. That's 4 6. And then in uh, 4 11, 
we get another sense of representation, right? So up here in 4.1, you're to honor a teacher of God's word as the Lord, right? Hos Hirion. And then just a few verses later, it says, but do you who are slaves be subject to your master as to God's representative? in reverence and fear right so once again using the now here using the term god let's look at the greek like 411 some of these in, in terms of the references are, are also not some of the different language uh translations of the dk they're not all the same so be be mindful of that if you're going to be looking at the greek i'm using a greek version online that matches the kearsop lake version we're using for the english okay so that's what you'll need to do. You need to make sure if you're going to check these, or you want to check them, then fine. If you get the Loeb edition, you'll have them both in one little booklet. So in 411, right, it says, to your lords, right, to your masters, but you slaves be subjecting yourselves to lords of you, to your masters, to your lords, as tipto theu, right? As a type. That's what that means. Hos tipto theu, as a type of God. That's kind of interesting, right? Not just hos theu. Hos tipto theu. That the masters of the slaves or employers of people who worked back then, either for a wage, but under conditions that were referred to in this way as a doulas, right? It could be an actual slave who was sold into slavery or someone who works effectively as a slave, but who's paid nonetheless and has various liberties and things they can do, right? So you need to understand the society you're talking about or looking at if you're going to really discuss that issue, okay? But what we want to focus on here is this as a type of God. That's how they were to view the lords, right? So if ha, human slaves were to look at human masters or human workers were to look at human employers as a type of God, I don't know how anyone could think there would be a problem viewing the Son of God or the sons of God just like the Bible presents them, not only as gods, but as a type of God, right? As ones who represent God to us in their own spiritual person. Either way, I thought it was interesting language, right? Using God in that way a lot more loose and applicable to other individuals than you would probably find by Trinitarians. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not seeing anything that even suggests something close to later Trinitarian or Athanasian false doctrine, right? It's just like, it's all very similar to what we do and what the Bible says to this point, other than on some other issues, right? But when it comes to God and Jesus, at least to this point, I'm not seeing any problems. And I'm seeing some interesting use of language in comparative ways that suggests um, they understood how others could represent God in ways that didn't compromise the, his uniqueness or exclusiveness as the one God, the true God, right? All right, let's take a look at seven. Let's go back. English of Lake, chapter 7 of the D.K. Baptism. <clears throat> we'll just read this whole thing right here. Concerning baptism, baptize thus, having first rehearsed all things, baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in running water. But if thou hast no running water, baptize in other water. 
And if thou canst not in cold, then in warm. But if thou hast neither, pour water three times on the head, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And before the baptism, let the baptizer and him who is to be baptized fast, and any others who are able. And thou shalt bid him who is to be baptized to fast one or two days before. Now, so you can see here clearly something very similar to what we commonly read in Matthew 28, the baptismal form formula, that some people question, um, because it's not in every Greek manuscript we have, and it's not in some later Hebrew versions that, while useful and important in some ways, certainly I don't think Trump texts like Vaticanus at this point. We don't have sufficient textual representation of an early enough Hebrew or Aramaic Gospel of Matthew to say that the reading of Vaticanus and others is incorrect. And we have the D.K. right here. Not that this proves it, but certainly if it is written from the late first century to the mid second, very consistent. And in the D.K., there's another reference. I don't think I brought it into these because, yeah, I just thought I'd mention it. There's another reference where it just says, baptize in the name of the Lord, just like the Bible, right? So it's not that, even though it, it is kind of prescribed here, right? There's certainly more here than in the New Testament, right? Even though here there's nothing that's a problem in terms of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, is basically what the Bible says. It's not Trinitarian stuff, right? But this whole, all this other stuff that it's talking about with baptism, you know, cold or warm water and pouring on the head three times if you don't have a cold or warm water or no running water. None of this is in the Bible. It's fasting before. It's not that it's necessarily bad, but Right. I mean, there's some things here that clearly are not based on the Bible. So once again, it gives me a little reason for pause the way it's presenting them as if it is like necessary formula. Right. All right, let's go to eight. Not a very long one here. Let's 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 go ahead and read it. Let not your fast be with the hypocrites. For they fast on Mondays and Thursdays, but do you fast on Wednesdays and Fridays? And do not pray as the hypocrites, but as the Lord commanded in his gospel, pray thus, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven so also upon the earth. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into trial, but deliver us from the wicked evil one. For thine is the power and the glory forever. Pray thus three times a day. Right? And so here you see kind of that, you see something similar to the variant reading we find, but very, really not very supported to the uh, biblical uh, Lord's Prayer in Matthew. This for thine is the power and the glory forever. That's um, a variant reading in some New Testament texts. And here... In the D. K. And then it says, pray three times a day. Pray this three times a day. Right? Well, what did Jesus say? Didn't Jesus say not to say the same thing over and over? Does that mean this over and over three times or ten times? Or I don't know that I would say the exact same thing over and over three times if I just read that I'm not supposed to say it over and over again, right? A little bit concerning right there. And then this whole fasting on Mondays, um, not fasting on Mondays and Thursdays, but only on Wednesdays and Fridays. Again, that's again, the Bible says not to judge people over days, moons, festivals. Uh, so that's in Colossians, Colossians 2, I think. 
again, I just, this is stuff that's just not consistent with the Bible. It's additional stuff. So something that concerns me there, nothing having to do with Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit, right? This is all very biblical, right from the Bible, pretty much, except for this last part. But this other stuff, again, we're starting to see, as we did in Shepherd of Hermas, this kind of additional information that while it may not be on its face so sinister or bad, it's not required. This is the same problem that gets other groups in the problems, right? Watchtower and others are coming up with these requirements, these rules and things that next thing you know, they're biblical. Well, no, they're not. You just keep forcing people to do things the way you want to do them. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to be making it easier on people, not just easier on you. All right, let's take a look at chapter 9. We're getting close to the end, everybody. Thank you for joining me. Let me just take a quick look here. Make sure we have uh, peace and harmony in the chat. <laughs> Good to see you also, Barnabas. Says there is such a lack of love in the general quote unquote Christian population. I pray for those who are servants of Jah, followers of Christ in the Bible. I hope you all pray for me too. Absolutely. And we pray for everybody, hopefully, right? We're not, we forget, but you know, we can try to do things simply. Wake up every day, give the Father praise, like I talked about before. Very simple, very powerful, right? Pray for each other, the people that you come to know. Very brief. Real, real quick mentions, if necessary, just to get it done so that Pete, so that you can. Send that forth to the Father and allow Him to, rec to, to respond the way that they do and to provide things that they can see we need in ways that match what we're asking for. We are, we're part of what takes place in ways that if we don't show faith, certain things just aren't going to happen the same way. Uh, God will ultimately do what He needs to do, right? But if we can ask for something to be done that needs to be done and then He just does it or gets it done, because we're asking for it, probably important that we do it. So good to see you. Okay, everything looks good. Let's get back to it. Let's finish it up here. So number nine, and concerning the Eucharist, hold Eucharist thus. Talking about, you know, the bread and the wine. First concerning the cup, we give thanks to thee, our Father, for the holy vine of David, thy child. Have you noticed again this second time what? that the DDAK is showing us how to pray. How is it showing us how to pray? To the Father, right? Like Jesus showed us in Matthew. And again, right here, there is no praying to Jesus like Trinitarians do. That's later doctrine. I'm not saying we can't appeal to Jesus like Stephen did or even speak to him in a sense similar to how we do job, but that's not how we're taught to pray. He taught us to pray through him to the Father in Matthew 6 and John 14. So what's the problem? Why not just do what he says? Yeah, if Jesus appears in a vision, standing right there to the Father, go ahead and talk to him. Ask him for help. That doesn't seem to be a problem. But if he told you to pray to the Father, then why are you doing anything differently other than those times? Anyway, right here, they're staying consistent with it, which thou didst make known to us through Jesus thy child. Right? This is the Greek word pice. It means a servant. Like a slave type servant, at least in the ancient world times ways. It was very normal. Nothing at all that would be used of someone who was a God-man or equal to God while a man. It wouldn't even be possible. One person. So it wouldn't even be possible for him to have the mindset of a slave if he's a God-man. He'd have the mind of the God. You can't have the two different mindsets at the same time, Trinitarians. That's two people. See, Trinitarians just have invented two people. One who's totally God and one who's not. And then just claim that they're one. No, 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 that's see One plus one equals, you to get to see Trinitarians in their math problem again, right? It's just terrible. Oh my. 
there's nothing in the Bible in anything in life, and it's against everything in life and everything in the Bible, the way they absolutely destroy Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, just create this fantasy Jesus or this non-existent Jesus that allegedly has two sets of attributes that contradict each other in the same mind. They're nuts, everybody. The reason why they create this kind of bizarre Jesus that doesn't fit reality, because, you know, you know, they're, they're nuts, right? That doesn't make any sense. So well, you, you tell me why. Well, yeah, to protect their false doctrine, but who would do that? But someone who's nuts. Right? You're that insane over believing something that's false? You'll lie about the Messiah's mind? Are you nuts? Well, I mean, we already agreed on that, right? So back to the D.K. to restore some of our sanity, okay? Ha <laughs> ha! Once we get into the, the bizarre and the, the whacked out kind of concepts about God and Jesus, the whole Athanasius stuff we'll get to in a moment, and some more modern nuts, uh, it just descends into craziness. Huh? It's not, uh, the, the, the minor entertainment value really is just questionable as to be worth it, right? So once again, we give thanks, our Father, for the life and knowledge which thou didst make known to us through through Trinitarians, through Jesus, thy child, thy pious Trinitarians, slave, not a God man, not a divine slave, Trinitarians, just a, just a slave, a servant, a, a man, you know, last Adam died faithful, lower than the gods, right? Hebrews 2, 7 and 9, some 8, 5, 6, Trinitarians, that's it. It's over, right? I'm going to show too what I mean, right? The whole collapse and breakdown that we're seeing happening right now uh, that's going to continue as we proceed further into Athanasius where it's just all, that's really where the whole God man and, you know, and really all the really false doctrine about homoousios and sharing the same nature just gained ground right that's where it all just fell apart and he was a catastrophe not just for christianity but for the community right for even the the nation at that time i think he really just caused nothing but trouble damaged people god and interfered between the master and his servants on communion just a really despicable person, like some people today. Anyway, back to the text of the D.K. So, let's read this part. As this broken bread was scattered upon the mountains, but was brought together and became one, so let thy church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into thy kingdom. For thine is the glory and the power through Christ Jesus forever, or Jesus Christ. Again, that, that additional part to the model prayer we sometimes see. So we get Jesus again multiple times referred to as God's child, as his servant, the one through whom God made known to us these things. Prayers to the Father, right? Holy Spirit is involved, just like in the Bible. Nothing in any way that would suggest something about uh, sharing of the nature of one God, right? <laughs> Consubstantial with the Father. There's none of that stuff. Oh, God comes about later. We'll get a preview of that in a moment, though. Chapter 10. All right. But after, oh, let me go up here. After you are satisfied with food, thus give thanks. We give thanks to thee, O Holy Father, for thy holy name. Third time, right? Or fourth time, I think. That we're seeing the same type of praying we see in the Bible. Always to the Father. Emphasis on his name. For thy holy name, which thou didst make, us make to tabernacle, 
in our hearts and for the knowledge and faith and immortality which thou didst make it known to us through Jesus thy child. Once again, using pious of Jesus, to thee be glory forever. Thou, Lord Almighty, didst create all things for thy name's sake. Once again, Almighty and creative power, Katizo, is exclusively attributed to the Father. Didst create all things for thy name's sake and didst give food. Again, I'll emphasis on the his name as well, as well as Jesus, right? But, you know, they're both important Trinitarians. And drink to men for their enjoyment, that they might give thanks for thee. But us hast thou blessed with spiritual food and drink and eternal light through thy child. Above all, we give thanks to thee, for thou art mighty. To thee be glory forever and ever. Or forever. And then let's go ahead and read five and six. Yeah, this is very this is a good part. <clears throat> we're very, we're closely in everybody. Remember, Lord, thy church to deliver it from all evil and to make it perfect in thy love, and gather it together in its holiness, <clears throat> excuse me, from the four winds to thy kingdom, which thou hast prepared for it. For thine is the power and the glory forever. Again, third time that, that phrase. Let grace come and let this world pass away. Hosanna to the God of David. If any man be holy, let him come. If any man be not, let him repent. Maranatha. Amen. And of course, we know the God of David, right? The God of David was not Trinitarian. <laughs> The Messiah of David was not a second person of the Trinity. We've established that very clearly in our Bible and the Trinity Conflict series and our C.W. Jah talk shows. So, regarding the pre-Christian evidence that Jesus is the Messiah, specifically Isaiah 9 and 11, and 53, and 6. <laughs> so, I encourage you to take a look at those. But again here, nothing really out of place, everybody. Everything we read and that I read in the DDK that pertains to Jesus, the Father and the Holy Spirit, is biblical. Jesus is always separate from God. He is never the object of our prayer. The Father is our object. His name is emphasized. The Holy Spirit is mentioned along the, with the Father and the Son, similar to Matthew 28. The Holy Spirit is not in any way defined as a separate person of a triune God or co-equal with the Father or the Son. Jesus is repeatedly referred to as Pais, the Pais of the Father, the slave or servant. Only the Father is referred to as Almighty or as the Creator, Katizo. So, that's it, everybody. Uh, well, actually, no, I'm sorry. There is one more. I apologize. I almost ended too early. Chapter 11. This is our last part. Whosoever, get there, whosoever then comes and teaches you all these things aforesaid, receive him. But if the teacher himself be perverted and teach another doctrine to destroy these things, do not listen to him. But if his teaching be for the increase of righteousness and knowledge of the Lord, receive him as the Lord. Just like we read earlier. It's the same expression. We go down, we take a look at the Greek. Right, chapter 11. Right here. As the Lord. Receive him as the Lord. Hos kirion. Just like earlier. The second time. And concerning the apostles and prophets, act thus according to the ordinance of the gospel. Let every apostle who comes to you be received as the Lord. Same expression. But let him not stay more than one day, or if need be a second as well. But if he stays three days, he is a false prophet. And when an apostle goes forth, let him accept nothing but bread until he 
reach his night's lodgings, but if he asks for money, he is a false prophet. I think that's all I wanted to read right there. Because basically, right, there's there's nothing else that pertains to, um, for example. Or no, there is. Okay, I'm sorry. For whatever reason, I keep uh, cutting off where I wanted to stop because I just didn't realize there, there were more. I apologize. So let's keep reading. Do not test or examine any prophet who is speaking in a spirit. For every sin shall be forgiven, but this sin shall not be forgiven. But not everyone who speaks in a spirit is a prophet, except he have behavior of the Lord. From his behavior, then, the false prophet and the true prophet shall be known. So, you know, there's some things here that are biblical and some not, right? We get this repeated reference to accepting people and apostles as the Lord. Right, we get um, some additional requirements like if you stay three days, you're a false prophet. That's not in the Bible, right? So I, I don't know of anything in the Bible that would be supportive of that. And again, it's a little more legalistic, more rules based that aren't in the Bible that gives me reason for pause. Um, this part here is kind of good, right? Behavior. So right. So if we look at Sam, right, his behavior, right, would put him in the category of a false prophet. <laughs> Don't worry, Sam, we'll get to you and Athanasius in just a minute. Right, just a little bonus right there. Um, Let's see, is any of this more important? No prophet who orders a meal in the spirit shall eat of it. Otherwise, he's a false prophet. Every prophet who teaches the truth, if he do not what he teaches is a false prophet. And our last part of this chapter, but no prophet who has been tried and is genuine, though he enact a worldly mystery of the church, if he teach not others to do what he does himself, shall be judged by you. For he has his judgment with God. For so also did the prophets of old. But whosoever shall say in the spirit, give me money or something else, you shall not listen to him. But if he tell you to give on behalf of others in want, let none judge him. I think that's correct, right? That's what we do here. <laughs> um, so nothing wrong there. Another point I wanted to highlight that I thought was a good aspect of this uh, document. Some things that are questionable, some things that are good. Nothing really wrong that I saw that we're going to see as we finish up here. Nothing out of line with what the Bible teaches concerning um, God, Jesus, or the Holy Spirit. Okay, this is our last section, chapter 16. Watch over your life. Let your lamps be not quenched, and your loins be not ungirded. But be ready, for ye know not the hour in which our Lord cometh. But be frequently gathered together, seeking the things which are profitable for your souls, for the whole time of your face shall not profit you, except ye be found perfect at the last time. For in the last days, this this this, this probably get your interest watched out, people. <laughs> last days, the false prophets and the corruptors shall be multiplied, and the sheep shall be turned into wolves, and love shall change to hate. For as lawlessness increases, they shall hate one another, and persecute and betray. For then shall appear the deceiver of the world as a son of God, like the Antichrist. And shall do signs and wonders, and the earth shall be given over into his hands, and he shall commit iniquities which have never been seen since the world began. And I think that, that part here, that the deceiver, if this, this is the Antichrist, appearing as a son of God, that's consistent with how I was explaining the 666 or 616, the meaning, as sort of like a, a divine king. It seems to me consistent with that as a son of God, a divine type Messiah figure. Anyway, let's read our last part here. This part, I think, is significant in terms of its understanding of Jesus. Then shall the creation of mankind come to the fiery end. Fiery trial, I'm sorry. And many shall be offended and be lost. 
and they who endure in their faith shall be saved by the curse itself. And then shall appear the signs of the truth. First the sign spread out in heaven, then the sign of the sound of the trumpet, and thirdly the resurrection of the dead. That's like 1 Thessalonians 4.16, right? It doesn't explicitly call Jesus the archangel here, but it's validating that account by borrowing language from it. And then it goes on to say, this last part here, but not all of the dead, but as it was said, the Lord shall come and all his saints with him. Then shall the world see the Lord coming on the clouds of heaven. Right? So this is at the time when he returns, the second coming, after the great tribulation, right? The end of the sign of the Son of Man will appear. He will arrive, separate the sheep from the goats, gather together those who are alive and faithful to him. The resurrection of the dead occurs. He's brought with him those who are with God and who are given new spiritual bodies. So to me, this is validating not only the account in 1 Thessalonians 4, but notice here it also says not all of the dead. Well, that validates Revelation chapter 20, right? The rest of the dead don't come to life until the end of the thousand years. After it talks about the resurrection of those who, just like in 1 Thessalonians 4 and right here in the D.K, are resurrected when Jesus returns at his second coming. So again, I, I found this very good, very useful. Overall, I would say, I think the reasons I highlighted are sufficient to show probably the document as we have it today is not reflective entirely of what is taught in the Bible, but it is completely accurate that I can tell in terms of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it also has other beneficial aspects to it by highlighting two of our three main beliefs, loving God with our whole heart, soul, and mind, and our neighbors, ourself, and of course advocating our third main belief, Jesus is the Messiah, sent forth Son of God. And also presenting teachings consistent with what we read in texts like 1 Thessalonians 4, Matthew 6, and Revelation 20. So that I think the D.K. is a helpful document to read. There's nothing that's going to hurt you in it. But there are a couple things. Well, there might be a couple things, right? If you start thinking you can redeem your sins with what you gain by your hands. You might be, you might misinterpret that and get in some trouble there. And um, some of the other regimented things about uh, fasting and what days to do things and how many times to say the Lord's Prayer each day, right? Those are a little concerning. So I can't, I wouldn't put it in the collection of New Testament documents. I don't think we have enough manuscript or historical references to sufficiently provide enough evidence to, to give it enough credibility to accept like the New Testament documents. We don't know the author. We don't know the author of Hebrews either. We have a lot better manuscript history and authority in association with other writings by people like Paul to where it's not as much of a problem. Here, together with everything else and the lack of manuscript history and authority, to me, creates a sufficient enough problem to not include it with other texts in the New Testament. It's beneficial. It has value. And there's nothing in it that's inconsistent with what the Bible says about Jesus or God or the Holy Spirit. And what it does present is in contrast or in contradiction, really, right, to the Trinity. Because it's lack of articulation of any of these relationships between God and the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit shows that's not what they believe. Jesus was a servant of God. We were only to pray to the Father. Only the Father is the Almighty. Only the Father is the Creator, Katizo. That's what the Bible teaches. It's not what the Trinity teaches, though. So, now, I have a bonus for you. Ready? I'm going to give you a quick sample 
of the great heretic Athanasius that we are going to get to pretty soon, maybe in the next couple months, we'll just start it, you know, because it's going to be a lot of reading, but I think it's, you're going to enjoy it in the sense that we'll be able to expose false doctrine. And you'll see where all this stuff is coming from, right? That'll be insanity. <laughs> uh, let's see. I think uh, Japheth is, is talking about something here. So before we get to the whole Athanasius thing. <laughs> um, what, what did Japheth say? Stephen was not praying to Jesus in Acts 7.59. I know. I know that. But I don't think it would be a problem praying. I mean, I guess if he were like praying the way Jesus was said to pray to the Father, if he started doing that. Well, again, it wouldn't be what Jesus said to do, right? So yeah, it'd be a problem. But right, praying, there is a more formal prayer type thing, like like the model prayer. But there's also like just talking to God type prayer, right? So like Jesus in John 17, you know, he's praying to God. But he's not saying the model prayer, right? He's just kind of talking to him. But but he does start to pray to him, it says. But is he's, again, I, so... I see the Acts 7 Stephen thing as different. I don't see it as a prayer. I see more as talking to him, right? It even uses the verb epikaleo, which is which is used between um a human and and um another human ruler. Right? Appealing to someone who has more authority than you, which Stephen was doing right there, right? Because he was in, in trouble and <laughs> needed some help. So I don't see I don't see anything supporting praying to Jesus either. I do see talking to Jesus as acceptable, right? Paul talked to Jesus. Stephen talked to Jesus. John talked to Jesus. Jesus says, "Ask." And, you know, there's a variant reading in some some of the texts in John uh, where Jesus talks about, you know, ask me anything or ask the Father anything, and I will do it. So, you know, I don't believe we should pray to Jesus. He didn't tell us to do that. He told us exactly what to do, and it's not pray to him. So, but I don't see any problem talking to him. If that makes, hopefully that makes sense.